I want to say thank you for taking a few minutes with Granite Rock, sir. We're talking with John o, uh, L. O'Sullivan of John Nash. Sullivan. No, no L. <laughs> I always thought it was an L. Well, I that, that's the uh, that's the, the boxer. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to have to go back and change my post. Well, I want to say thanks for taking a few minutes with Granite Rock and have a leading conservative blog site. Thank you. Um, enjoyed the speech quite a bit. And you certainly brought up a lot of topics that are at the forefront right now. And one of the takeaways that I got is that you're telling the GOP, at least the, the Republicans that were here tonight at the Crown Plaza, don't change yourselves just to pander for voters. Is that a quick encapsulation? It, yes, it doesn't mean don't change yourselves at all. It means don't change yourselves just for, to pander for voters. Uh, it means also hold on to the voters you've got and use them as a base and win more voters. But don't do so be, um, by adopting policies you don't believe in because the voters will detect that you're insincere. And, and um, what's the better policy is to look at the areas um, where you don't seem to have support and either make the argument more clearly and strongly um, or look for amendments to the policy that might make it more acceptable. But fundamentally, um, you know, if you're, if you're in the business of uh, advising on how best to improve the chances of life, lives of people in America, um, that should be the criterion and not winning winning. You spent most of your time talking about the issues, but there's also another uh, fight going on between the grassroots and what I call the elites. Being a Tea Party type person, I was listening to what you were saying, and uh, you know everybody has nits with everything, but I really see that when the Tea Party started, the grassroots really exploded it, on the conservative side, not necessarily the Republican, but on the conservative side. And I've always gotten the impression that the elites of the Republican Party have kind of looked down their noses uh, at the re at the rest. How does that play into the speech that you talked about on the issues vis-a-vis? Uh, -vis? Some people want to say, just keep it to the fiscal issues. Let's get rid of that social conservatism. Uh, we don't have to worry about the issues that the grassroots worry about. Do you see that as a very huge dynamic in the party right now? Well, I think that's always going to be a dynamic in the party. And I think that at the moment, the, uh, the, the elites are trying to say that we've lost the recent election because we followed uh, what the ordinary members of the party wanted. The fact is, they ran, the elites ran the campaign. I mean, it wasn't to admit Romney is an elitist conservative. No, no problem with that. But the fact is, he's not a ranking father. Practically, that whole campaign was a, was a, uh, was a campaign. Um, the, what was the biggest failure in that campaign? The biggest failure was to win more working class votes. Uh, they were up for grabs. Romney wasn't the best man to appeal to them, and Wall Street guy never will. But he didn't even make much of an attempt to do so. And only at the very end did he tour around the Northeast talking to the workers uh, and trying to get uh, trying to get them to come over. And then the, the Obama campaign panicked and called in Bill Clinton and to neutralize him. And, and that's what Clinton did in the final days of the campaign. He tried to make sure that the working class, not just white, um, the black as well, but certainly the working class stayed on board with the Democrats. And to give Bill Clinton credit, he largely succeeded, but he wouldn't have been able to do so if an appeal had been made to those voters much more consistently throughout the campaign. Well, certainly the issues, I believe, were not very well articulated, because even when you talk about fiscal conservatism, which is what the elites wish to push, a Tea Party bastion defense, you see Republicans saying one thing, okay, we'll defund Obamacare, and then in the last couple of votes up down in D.C., we see them, well, let's vote for that continuing resolution, which doesn't defund Obamacare, and we see that here in New Hampshire as well. Republicans saying one thing, doing another thing. So I bring up two words, consistency and trust. Does the party as a whole have problems with those two words? Well, first of all, I agree with you that you have to have consistency in order to build trust. That's absolutely clear. Um, does the party, has the party succeeded in doing so? Well, plainly it hasn't, or else it would be doing much better. But I'm not the person to come to 
when you're looking for minute examination of tactical moves in Congress. You know, but let's be fair here, um, sometimes such moves are necessary. I'll give you one example. Um, the, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, a uh, conservative should put forward a motion he knows he's going to lose to force the other side to come out on the record against him, which Ted Cruz has just done. Correct. And, and that's a kind of political uh, uh, parliamentary tactics I think we should go in for. But I'm not the expert on them, and you'd probably be in much worse uh, position if I was the guy calling those shots. Well, I, I look at it... Not we have to, <laughs> yeah, I look at it from the standpoint that everybody's saying, well, we have to rebrand. Well, in marketing, as uh, most people know, you can't market a brand successfully long-term without a consistency in which the consumer can trust. And, and I posit that we don't have that right now in the Republican Party, either at the local level or at the national level. And especially at the national level, even though, as you pointed out, we took most of the state legislatures, we took most of the governors, but we seem to be lacking at the national level. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, party images or brands are actually much less amenable to change than advertising people think. Uh, it's one thing to change the brand image of a cigarette or a breakfast cereal. That's because people don't have much invested in them. Ordinary consumers don't have much invested in the image of a cereal or a cigarette. Um, but, the, but the image of a party is something that is very deeply etched in our minds and imaginations from very early years. For good and ill. It's not always fair, as I was trying to argue today. But it's there. So what can you do to change it? Well, one thing is events in the real world sometimes change it. If you have a reputation as a competent party and you screw up economically, then you're going to find your brand image is reduced. It won't go away entirely, but it, will be, uh, it won't be as appealing as it was for a long time. You have to rebuild trust. There you're right. On the other hand, trying to change it by, you know, gestures like, I gave England's a good example, you know, David Cameron changes the symbol of the uh, uh, the party from the torch of liberty to a tree, and um, and then he he goes off to uh, he goes off to uh, um, Alaska uh, and is seen you know, to emphasize green issues behind a sled on a sledge behind huskies, and he he actually erects a windmill on his roof which gives him a desultory amount of uh, no no electricity. And another thing is he decides he's going to uh, to ride to work, which he does for a short while until a newspaper discovers that a car is taking his his um, attached case to work. So <laughs> these kind of things, they don't work. And they shouldn't work. And, and, and even, you know, even better uh, organized and more sincerely felt ones are hard to pull off. So I think you've got to accept you, you, uh, your party brand has strengths and weaknesses. Um, you should concentrate as far as possible on the strengths. You know, the Republican brand is a patriotic brand. You should stress that. Um, the Democratic Brand, brand is a compassionate brand. They should, they should stress that. The Republicans have got to do something about their lack of compassion brand. That's now seriously hurting them. But they've got to do something real. They've got to do something. Uh, uh, gestures won't do it. And what the, therefore I said I had, I think, an eight-point program just now of changes they could uh, push, assist, things they've often done, by the way, but haven't then taken the credit for. Now it's become important to take the credit for the good works they've done and not simply regard those as second-order issues. And, and, and as I say, I don't exaggerate the degree to which the brand can be changed, but it will have, but we, but, you know, the Republicans need to do something about the fact that they're not seen as occurring. Well, I want to say thank you very much for taking a few minutes with Granite Rock, and I look forward to seeing more of your posts on uh, National Reviews of the Corner, which I enjoy very, very much. Thank you very much. Can I just say, I was wrong. John L. Sullivan was the famous editor of the Democratic New York paper in the 19th century who invented the term, um, uh, what is it, uh, Manifest Destiny. Uh, and so to that, and and I am myself a kind of a paleo manifest destinary. <laughs> so uh, there is, although he's a Democrat, there is some connection between us. Well, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Clock TV.